we'll get started in a moment. I do want to apologize if I'm a little bit uh, slower or groggier. I did not sleep well. I got hit with a kidney stone attack as I was getting ready for bed last night, so I didn't quite get to sleep as much or as comfortably as I should. And I will probably go home and push fluids and walk and all that good stuff later on today. I am wearing my Three Floyds shirt in the great hopes that today is finally the day Newcastle United will sell. I don't know, but uh, something will look good. I also have a sty in my left eye, so I'm wearing my glasses. I'm falling apart. Okay. That's okay. The Lord is still good, and we will go and worship and ponder his word. So let's begin. Uh, morning prayer, page 295, found in your hymnal. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our psalmody for the Monday after the third Sunday of Easter is Psalm 80, verses 1 through 7. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up your might and come to save us. Restore us, O God, let your face shine, that we may be saved. O Lord, God of hosts, how long will you be angry with your people's prayers? You have fed them with the bread of tears, and given them tears to drink in full measure. You make us an object of contention for our neighbors, and our enemies laugh among themselves. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Um, I am going to comment on this very briefly. One of the things that the Psalms does very well, that we do not do well as modern American Christians, is that when there is tragedy that befalls the people, and the Psalms do this really well, the Old Testament does it well, the prophets do, there is an acknowledgement that God is at work. And so you raise your lament to God, but even so doing, you recognize that God is still working good, even though you're getting stopped by it. Um, silly example. All right. I have now, I'm working on a kidney stone, all right? Well, that means my day has changed, and not necessarily in a pleasant way, and yet I am sure that somehow, in some way, God will use it for good, even if it's just a happy illustration in the devotional. But but that, that God uses tragedy and suffering to bring about his good for people and to bring them to repentance. And... Um, th this is really one of the things that we forget. Uh, as Lutherans, we'll talk about the second use of the law. The, the primary theological use of God's law isn't about behavior modification. It isn't about uh, letting us be good people. The main point of the law is to drive us to repentance, to remind us of our need for a Savior. And you have this cry coming out to God. And I have no idea what uh, Joseph and Ephraim and Manasseh and Benjamin were, were up to when this was written. Uh, no, Ephraim and Manasseh are the two sons of Joseph. There is no tribe of Joseph. He gets two. And uh, Levi isn't counted among the tribes. But they're driven back to God. And they recognize this is what God is doing. O oh Lord, God of hosts, how long will you be angry with your people's prayers? We, we had forgotten our prayers, and thus you were right to be angry, but rather you who are enthroned upon the cherubim shine forth. It, it's a, a great thing. Uh, again, if you are feeling overwhelmed or burdened at this time or isolated, you do what the church has done for 3,000 years. You pick up the book of Psalms and go through. So with that, we'll be moving on to Luke chapter 7. And just as a heads up, uh, basically... Uh, through the month of May, we're going to be going through the Gospel of Luke. Um, with the Treasury of Daily Prayer, the, uh, the readings in Luke end with a, on Trinity Sunday, which is basically, I think it's the first Sunday in June this year. But we'll be moving through the Gospel of Luke, so thus I'm highly indebted 
to uh, my professor, Art Just, who was a prof also at the seminary when my dad was there. Um, the prof my dad had more at the seminary than any other prof. And so I learned many things from Dr. Just via my father, even in junior high. Um, so let's dive in. Luke 7, chapter, uh, Luke chapter 7, verse 1. After he, that is Jesus, had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now a centurion had a servant who was sick and at the point of death. He was highly valued by him. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation, and he is the one who built us our synagogue. And Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore I did not presume to come to you, but say the word and let my servant be healed. For I too am a man under authority, with soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled him, and turning to the crowd that followed him, said, I, say, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to their house, they found the servant well. Soon afterward, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out. The only son of his mother and she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came up and touched the bier, and the bearer stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding countryside. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Um, I'm going to dive into some weeds and get into some trouble. We do get the uh, Jesus raising the, the widow of Nain uh, sermon. That, that comes up every year. Uh, normally in August, September, that time period. I think it's Trinity 13, 14, something like that. Um, we also do get the, uh, the healing of the centurion servant, but we get it in Matthew. And one of the things that stands out is Matthew tells the story diff differently. Matthew just has the centurion come, and, and the centurion says all this stuff, and Jesus offers to go with the centurion, and, and no, no, I'm not worthy. Luke brings out an extra nuance that, well, actually, the centurion is doing this to be a servant. And this is something that, that strikes modern hearers very odd. Well, there's a contradiction. What's going well, no, to the ancient world, there'd be no contradiction whatsoever. Uh, what you do is you have different emphasis a different point of emphasis. With Matthew, the, the centurion's the main guy, and, and he's highlighting the faith of the centurion, and then also, right after that, or right before it, is the, uh, the, the uh, woman with the unclean woman who's healed. No, no, it's a leper right before that. It's a leper right before that. So you get, you get the two look down upon people, and look, here is faith there. Uh, Luke's gospel ends up going out much more amongst the, the Gentiles who are much more used to dealing, much more used to being Gentiles and having the, the Jewish folks as strangers. And so you, you get the emphasis here that this centurion wasn't just some run-of-the-mill guy, but he was a guy who was a good supporter of the Jewish community. That, that the, the interplay and the fondness between Jew and Gentile that is coming out as Paul preaches the gospel is not something as abstract or new as you might think. No, this is going, I mean, yeah, you guys know that there are places where, especially when you're outside of Jerusalem, if you were a Roman centurion, your job was to maintain order. And that would also be to protect the, the members of the Jewish community that were there. And so you get that, that wonderful little, little interplay. And given that the centurion says, no, I'm all about orders. I tell someone to go, and they go, and someone to come, and they come, and I'm not going to tell you to come because you're not under my authority. Well, it dovetails perfectly well with him having servants go and do stuff, and friends go and do stuff. And it also brings up something very important theologically. When I finished the reading, 
I said, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're, we're used to that. We understand that when we hear these words written by Luke, read by, today me, but read by whomever, we're not just getting the word of Luke. We're not just hearing Pastor Brown. We are hearing the word of the Lord, that the Lord is speaking to us. In fact, this is really what goes on with the idea of being an apostle, an, a, a sent one. When you were a person's apostle, you were a spokesman for them. We get sort of this idea with uh, the idea of ambassadors. This is why Paul used the language, consider us ambassadors for Christ. Um, we have an ambassador in a foreign country. When that person speaks, when that ambassador speaks, he speaks for the country. And if you insult the ambassador, you're not just insulting that person. You are insulting the country that he represents. And that, that's just part of the movement. That, that's what goes on. That's why normally in church, I'm not just wearing a Three Floyds t-shirt, but I'm, I'm vested. I'm wearing the, the marks of my office to designate that, yes, what I'm reading from the pulpit over here isn't just my thought. That's why I don't read my own personal letters from the pulpit. That's for the word of God. That also comes up with the, the scriptures or scriptures, with the sermon. The sermon's not supposed to be my own thoughts. I mean, yes, I, I'm the one that write it, but, but I'm to be speaking the word of the Lord, and thus I should be able to end, amen, that is true. Otherwise, it doesn't belong there. You get that pattern set up already here and, and demonstrated here in Luke. And it dovetails really well, because what is Jesus doing? He, he is God, and what he says goes. And so that really just dives to the, the wonderful power of the word. I do want to speak briefly about the widow of Nain. I, I preach on this often. It's one of my favorite texts. And it's a, a matter of Jesus doing the unthinkable. Um, under the old Jewish law, you, you couldn't touch a dead body. You, you, you'd be richly unclean. And... Jesus walks him up, and first of all, he gets in the way of a funeral procession. Even now, today, we know you get out of the way of a funeral procession. The, the custom is going by, but when you see the, the hearse and everyone with their blinkers, you pull on over, you, you get out of the way, you let them go through. Well, Jesus walks up and stops. It, it would be like him walking up in front of the hearse, putting his hand on it, and stop. Whoa, whoa, hold on up, Chief. That, that's what he's doing. And he raises the kid, because that's what Jesus does. He comes to stop death in its tracks. It's not just a matter of healing, not just a matter of throwing his authority around, but rather he has come to raise the dead, to undo sin. And that remains true, even when we are in periods of mourning ourselves, when we are at places where uh, our, our normal procession of activities have been stopped, not by, uh, not by Jesus stopping them necessarily, well, Actually, we could say by Jesus stopping, but by uh, hardship and trial and, and pandemic and all that. So uh, the Lord continues to, uh, to be the Lord, and he works all things for your good. So remember that. All right. For today, our catechism lesson will be the Ten Commandments, which may be found on page 321, I believe, of our small, of our hymnal. So let me take a sip of coffee and then I'll begin. All right. What is the first commandment? You shall have no other gods. What does this mean? We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. What is the second commandment? You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not curse, swear, to use satanic arts, lie, or deceive by his name, but call upon in every trouble, pray, praise, and give thanks. What is the third commandment? Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not despise preaching and his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn. What is the fourth commandment? Honor your father and your mother. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not despise or anger our parents or other authorities, but honor them, serve and obey them, love and cherish them. What is the fifth commandment? You shall not murder. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not hurt or harm our neighbor in his body, but help and support him in every physical need. What is the sixth commandment? You shall not commit adultery. What does this mean? 
We should fear and love God so that we lead a sexually pure and decent life in what we say and do, and husband and wife love and honor each other. What is the seventh commandment? You shall not steal. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not take our neighbor's money or possessions or get them in any dishonest way, but help him to improve and protect his possessions and income. What is the eighth commandment? You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not tell lies about our neighbor, betray him or slander him, or hurt his reputation, but defend him, speak well of him, and explain everything in the kindest way. I will pause for a point of pastoral privilege. Even in times of pandemic and stress, the Eighth Commandment applies. Even to people you disagree with. Um, one of the things that we are quick and apt to do is to assign the, the uh, most horrid and wretched of motivations to people who disagree with us uh, politically or who have presented other uh, solutions for problems that we might not uh, agree with. Um, yeah, don't, don't betray them, don't slander them, don't hurt their reputation. Defend them, speak well of them, and explain everything in the kindest way. If you can't explain what your opponent is doing in a kind way, even while you disagree with it, you need to think about why you're opposing them. All right, end of pastoral privilege lecture. What is the ninth commandment? You shall not covet your neighbor's house. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not scheme to get our neighbor's inheritance or house or get in a way which only appears right, but help and be of service to him in keeping it. What is the tenth commandment? You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his manservant, or maidservant, his ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not entice or force away our neighbor's wife, workers, or animals, or turn them against him, but urge them to stay and do their duty. What does God say of all these commandments? He says, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the fathers of the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. What does this mean? God threatens to punish all who break these commandments. Therefore, we should fear his wrath and not do anything against them. But he promises grace and every blessing to all those who keep these commandments. Therefore, we should also love and trust in him and gladly do what he commands. So, thus the Ten Commandments go. We will confess now the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. On Monday, we are instructed to pray for uh, faith to live in the promises of holy baptism, for one's calling and daily work, for the unemployed, for the salvation and well-being of our neighbors, for schools, colleges, seminaries, and for good government and peace. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, as our work this week begins anew, we ask that you send us forth to wherever we may be going as the baptized, confident in the great love that you have for us in Christ Jesus, confident in the redemption and the forgiveness of sins, which is ours because of his death and resurrection upon the cross. Fill us with boldness, that we might boldly go where we need to go, that we might, with patience and love, stay where we need to stay, that we might go about the task you have set before us, Heavenly Father, be with those whose tasks of normal employment have been taken away at this time. Give them patience and peace. Help them to find uh, useful things to do around their own home, possibly other sources of employment. Stir up generosity and care for them, 
that they might be tended to both uh, physically, emotionally, mentally, and that they might enjoy peace. Be with our communities. Uh, defend those who are working in high-risk situations at this time. Uh, keep them safe by your sheltering hand. Be with all those who are in various nursing homes or other such facilities who are especially vulnerable. Uh, bless those who tend to them. Bless all residents and folks living there. Keep them safe and in the shelter of your hand. Be with our schools, especially as our teachers prepare lessons for our students at home. And for the students who are learning at home, grant that they might uh, learn this day in joy and that they might uh, be kept patient until they are able to see their friends once again. Heavenly Father, look with favor upon all the governments of the world. Grant them wisdom and discernment as they tend to the well-being of all. And grant that peace might reign even in the times of discord and strife that we find ourselves in. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, we tr place into your hands, trusting your great love and care for us. In Christ Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Uh, I will include the prayer of the day from the Treasury of the Daily Prayer. O God, by your almighty word, you set in order all things in heaven and earth. Put away from us all things hurtful, and give us those things that are beneficial for us. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Concluding prayers. Almighty God, merciful Father, who created and completed all things, on this day when the work of our calling begins anew, we implore you to create its beginning, direct its continuance, and bless its end, that our doings may be preserved from sin, our life sanctified, and our work this day be well-pleasing to you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Morning prayer. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen. All right. Have a good day. We will be doing a Bible study tonight at 7 p.m. Uh, I think we are at 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 7, verse 6, somewhere right around there, the, the start of a new section there. So um, other than that, I shouldn't say other than that. Until then, have a great day. If I see you online then, that'll be lovely. If not, I'll see you when I see you. Well, I'm going to check something. Okay. No, it just tells me who uh, that I, I've got people watching. I can't see who's actually watching. Oh, well, this is life. Have a great day, everyone. The Lord be with you.